Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here again with the one and only Neil Trevitt. So, I guess for the benefit of non-regular viewers, Neil, would you be so uh, kind as to introduce yourself and also what Cronus's role is in the industry? Absolutely. So, yeah, great to see you again, Paul. Thank you for inviting me back again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, people are going to start talking. They'll be like, wow, he actually <laughs> likes him for real. <laughs> I know, right? It's crazy. It happened before. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm so I'm Neil. Uh, my day job is at NVIDIA. Um, so I do developer ecosystem stuff, which is trying to help developers make good use of GPUs. Uh, but I'm primarily here today representing the Kronos Group, which is an open standards organization. And we focus a lot on 3D uh, API standards like uh, Vulkan and uh, OpenGL and XR standards like uh, uh, OpenXR and, and GLTF. Yeah, and there's a, there's a lot going on there, so lots to talk about. Okay, um, so it's been just over about half a year, I think, since we last talked, and the industry never slows down. <laughs> Um, right. And for Kronos, obviously, there's been a lot of announcement from you guys. Uh, there's Vulkan 1.3, the launch of OpenCL uh, free SDK upgrades. There's been more moves to standardize VR. For example, now you guys are working with HIF, which is the Haptics Industry Forum. And we'll delve deeper into specifics in a moment. But how do you personally feel the last half a year of, has gone for Kronos? And what achievements do you feel have stood out to you the most? Yeah, things are getting busier and busier. I, we keep saying it can't get any more busy, but it does. <laughs> um, <laughs> One of those so, things. <laughs> yeah, I, I, part of it, I'm going to use the M word early on in, in this uh, discussion, the, the metaverse. The, um, you know, there's a there's a lot of hype about the metaverse. No one knows what metaverse is going to be, and that's maybe something we can talk about. But the, but what it is doing, it's um, all these standards that we've been working on for many years. You know, the 3D standards, the XR related standards. Suddenly, people are kind of looking at them through a fresh lens, saying, "Oh, no, these are actually going to be interesting for the metaverse as well as you know the more traditional gaming and other applications." And I think that is, um, in part at least, what's raising. Um, the interest in interoperability standards, people are realizing the, the key role that standards are going, you know, are playing and will play going forward. And yeah, that's why we're getting busier and busier, which is which is a good thing, you know, because of course, if there's industry need out there, you know, that's why standards organizations exist to to help solve interoperability problems so everyone can build build a better business as well as you know building the metaverse, whatever that is going to be. Um, for those who don't know, could you just very briefly summarize what that is interoperability and like what the challenges are that developers are facing, particularly with all the different hardware standards? Yes. So no, an interoperability standard at, at its most basic is getting two things to communicate together. Now, it can be a hardware standard, actually, you know, like a USB, plugging a USB plug into a USB socket. It can be you know, wireless standards. It can be APIs like uh, Kronos uh, designs. So it's basically getting one thing to talk to another. And, and Kronos's focus is, we like to say, we're connecting uh, software to silicon. So uh, a, a, an application like a game um, wants to drive the GPU hardware. If you didn't have... Uh, open standards like uh, Vulkan, you know, we'll, we'll be back in the bad old days where every GPU vendor had a different API. And so the poor software developers made trying to make good games, you know, would have a nightmare of trying to run across different uh, types of hardware. So we solved that with interoperability uh, APIs. All the hardware vendors basically agree that we're going to use you know, a, a single API that everyone supports, so developers can write once and run everywhere. And you know, all of the APIs we do have that same fundamental interoperability, a, you know, enable portability of applications. So I guess this brings us to, I suppose for many gamers anyway, perhaps the most exciting uh, product, quote unquote, that you guys do, and that would be Vulkan. So 1.2 launched in January 2020, which feels like a long time ago now. And then two years later, we're at uh, 1.3, which has included 23 additional extensions. Um, so those, I believe, the extensions were already used quite extensively in the industry. Basically, they're proven. 
Um, yep. So I suppose the, the the first question is, could you, uh, because there's a lot of different uh, parts to the 1.3 update and the extension. So I, I've, I've just selected a couple of highlights because there are so many things we have to get through today. But uh, perhaps one of the big ones you guys were pushing was dynamic rendering. So could you explain uh, what that does and what challenges it solves for developers? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, and but let me just go back a couple steps and we'll get to, uh, to the dynamic rendering. But okay. You know, at the beginning, you, you were asking, um, you know, what, what are we most proud of? Uh, no, um, that's uh, true. Uh, Sorry, uh, you, uh, that's a no, good point. No, no, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll let you off the hook. And but but this speaks directly to that. Well, one of the things I, I'm proud of, particularly you know, with um, the Vulcan 1.3 release, is the focus of the working group is not just on shipping new specification api specification documents of course that that's that's key and still central to what we do but more and more we're putting more uh resources and effort and focus on actually making the apis more usable in the real world by real developers you know, so better sdks you know, software development uh, kits and you know the vulcan 1.3 comes with a you know, substantial upgrade to uh, to the SDK, which is now free free to download, um, but also addressing another real world problem that faces you know, all of the developers, um, which is uh, fragmentation. So it's it's a great strength of, of Vulkan is that we can extend it and bring new functionality. Uh, but in in the past, a lot of the extensions you know, they kind of roll out in in a wave. And so they are available on some hardware vendors and, and not others. So that can create a real problem for, for developers you know, if they're wanting to use a new extension, but it's not reliably available on all the pieces of hardware that they want to you know, ship their application or game on. It can be a real headache because they have then to have to write their application to sometimes use that new functionality and to cope if it's not there. I mean, that that's, a, that's, a, that's a hard to manage, particularly if you get a number of extensions that aren't um, shipping um, reliably everywhere. So one of the key things that um, Vulcan 1.3 has done is not only bring new functionality into the core spec, but it's made all that new functionality mandatory. Um, and that's actually quite different to the previous versions of uh, the Vulcan spec, where you know new functionality could come in, um, but it would be made optional in some cases uh, kind of and that kind of exacerbates the optional extensions optional core uh, too much optionality creates developer headaches so the um, with the Vulcan 1.3 release the working group said no no we need to take proactive action start reducing this fragmentation so the stuff that's gone in there is you know, going to be guaranteed to be there by anyone who supports Vulcan 1.3 and I think um, you know, can I that's can just, I just as important a as the, yeah well, one of the people I speak to with quite regularly that I don't want to put them on blast. I don't want to like name names, but they actually were talking to me recently and they were mentioning um, about Vulcan. I happened to mention that I was doing an interview with you and they actually were complaining about fragmentation, funnily enough. Yes. So, and so I, it's kind of funny because I wanted to get to this like in a roundabout way. But since you're talking about it now, I think, uh, could you just explain what the what the difficulties have been with fragmentation? Like uh, for those who aren't developers, like is it or are kind of looking at Vulkan with the idea of perhaps, you know, porting their games to the Vulkan ecosystem. Could you just briefly explain has what has the fragmentation been predominantly on? Has it been on the hardware side, the software side or, you know, what's kind of caused it? So there's two axes if you look you know if you were to try and plot a graph of how bad is the fragmentation there's two there's two two axes one is a is the temporal access uh so as um as the vulcan working group at chronos ships a new extension spec um and it's optional the it different hardware vendors will implement and ship that extension in different time frames Mm -hmm. So it might be available on no, AMD before it's available on NVIDIA or or, or on Intel before you know, AMD or like, you know, any combination. And that you know, is one way that um, the, the developers don't have a reliable um, reliable platform uh, to use. The other, the other dimension is different market segments. 
because the you know, one of the, the key goals of Vulkan is that we don't have different APIs for mobile, for example, and desktop. Um, but if you go from you know, uh, inexpensive mobile all the way to cutting edge, uh, high-end desktop, there's quite a broad range of functionality there. And it's just not physically possible to have a, you know, a cheap smartphone supporting all, everything you get on you know, a, a $1,000 GPU kind. It's just, it's just, that's not the way the world works. And so you get different functionality uh, available on different tiers of, of hardware. And that's, again, something that the developers have, have to cope with. So the mechanism that, we, that Vulkan 1.3 has introduced to, um, to help this fragmentation uh, problem is, is called profiles. And um, profiles are very simple. They're just a definition of functionality. Um, uh, at, its, at its most basic, it's you know, a, a core version of Vulkan plus the optional bits that you're making mandatory plus potentially some uh, optional extensions. So you, know, you basically create a list of the, the function, actually, functionality that's in the, in a profile. Plus you can actually go into more detail. You can start setting limits and minimum memory sizes and, and things like that. Once, once, once you have a concept of I can define this um, block of functionality, you, you, can, you can use that in, in various ways. So first of all, uh, like platform vendors can say, if you're using my platform, uh, we are going to guarantee that you know, the, the vast majority of hardware you care about supports this profile. And actually, that's what Google did along simultaneously with 1.3 launch. Um, uh, Google launched uh, an Android um, profile that says, if you want to access um, um, the vast majority of Android devices out there, uh, this, this is the set of Vulkan functionality that, that you can rely on to be uh, available. And the Vulkan Working Group itself um, has issued a Vulkan Roadmap 2022 profile, which is saying this is a set of functionality that if you're going from mid-range mobile you know, up to desktop, you know, this is the set of functionality. And the key thing, that the, the key value is, you know, in Google's case, Google has done the hard work to figure out that um, what pro what functionality um, developers can use, and in the Vulkan uh, roadmap profile, it's the hardware vendors in the working group have spent a long time, you know, um, uh, negotiating. You know, okay, this is stuff that we're all going to support, and so we can give uh, developers a much more um, um, reliable uh, platform. With that in mind, with the uh because obviously the the Vulkan API it doesn't support the consoles, right? Like Sony are not embracing it if memory serves. I think Nintendo are, and Microsoft won't. So it's mostly just like uh, desktop and other ecosystems. Is that correct? Well, it's um, no Vulkan. You're right. Nintendo does have a Vulkan uh, driver, but yes, Xbox and uh, PlayStation uh, don't. Yeah. Um, but Vulkan. Um, is uh, I mean, it and, could work on the PlayStation 5 if Sony opened it up, but they're quite happy to not open up their uh, ecosystem. Yeah, yeah. no, that, that's right. I mean, and of course, I just no, wanted to make that clear to people because I didn't want people to be a bit, you know, confused on that aspect. Sure, sure. And, you know, every platform vendor needs to decide what's best for their for their uh, business model. But but um, Vulkan is shipping in a bunch of places. So it's shipping in embedded, it's shipping in mobile. It's shipping on Windows, it's shipping on Linux, it's shipping on the desktop, it's sh shipping in the cloud. Um, so you know, there are a lot of um, uh, platform. Uh, well, one of, the strengths, one of the strengths of Vulkan as well is it can be used as a layer. So for example, a developer, could, a developer excuse me, could use Vulkan just for a specific thing, right? I mean, I remember NVIDIA were doing that quite extensively before uh, DirectX 12 Ultimate launched. Obviously, we had like DirectX, I'm sorry, Vulkan ray tracing, basically. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it, it's, it's very powerful in that respect, Vulkan, obviously. You know, developers can kind of dip their toe in, essentially. Yep, yep, no, exactly. And, you know, it, it is, you know, it is interesting. It's worth reminding us and everyone uh, that, you know, Vulkan is the only, um, new generation GPU API that is not blocked to a particular 
vendors platform. So um, it's a, a it's a good thing in the world to have a, uh, a an API that is you know, vibrant and evolving and can be portable to anyone who wants it and you know, is not under the control of you know, a, a particular uh, platform vendor. Definitely. I mean, for a while, this is going on a little bit of a tangent as we tend to do, but I feel that, you know, without a lot of pressure on Microsoft at one point or another, you know, the Windows uh, gaming experience was pretty awful with DirectX 11 being just absolutely dreadful for multi-thread. And it's like, you know, we wouldn't just want one CPU vendor for sake of argument, right? It's always good to have that that healthy competition to a degree. Yeah, no, it is healthy competition. Uh, but, but you know, to DirectX is actually an awesome API. No, know? definitely. I'm not. Yeah. I'm not. I'm not saying DirectX 12 is bad. I'm just. No, no, it's uh, it's actually good, and, and and Microsoft do an awesome job with it, and and but it, it comes back to what you're saying. You no, know, competition is good. Choice is good, and you know, um, if the platform vendors have their own API, you no, know, there are good business reasons to do it. Um, but there's also good reasons you know, to have um, a, a free and open API to, to, to complement that. It's actually really amazing at what's actually happened in the industry in the last, well, seemingly very little time, actually. I mean, just the last six months alone, it kind of feels like everything's turning on its head in both hardware and software. Um, and, you know, the feature set that we're starting to see on the next generation of hardware is going to be really interesting. So I, I guess that kind of brings us to the 1.3 stuff. Um, and you did touch on dynamic rendering earlier, well, kind of before I, until you rightly pulled me back and said, hang on, we haven't <laughs> even talked about the good stuff yet. I was like, oh yeah, I'm supposed to be doing that. <laughs> so maybe you could quickly bring up the dynamic rendering thing. Yeah, so dynamic rendering is, is, a, is a good example. So the, the interesting, interesting thing about Vulcan 1.3 is there's no um, functionality that has been bought in and made mandatory in, in 1.3 that people haven't seen already. You know, we are bringing proven uh, extensions into Core and making them mandatory. And dynamic rendering is one of the most often uh, requested extensions. So like, please make this mandatory and support it uh, everywhere. Um, and it's a, it's a ease of programming quality of life uh, uh, extension for, uh, for developers. So you know, Vulkan has um, uh, render pass uh, objects. And if you have a tiled renderer, you know, some of the GPUs use tile rendering, they you know, divide the screen up into tiles, it helps them optimize their uh, rendering uh, performance. Then render pass uh, objects and sub passes are the way that you can uh, direct how rendering happens to so you get good performance on those tiled uh, architectures. The problem up until 1.3 was that if you didn't want or need to optimize for tiled renderers, you still had no choice. You still had to use render pass objects. And it, it introduced quite a lot of complexity into how you set things up before you can actually start drawing any pixels. So in, in essence, uh, what dynamic rendering does, uh, you, you don't need to use any uh, uh, render pass objects anymore. Uh, you can just go straight to rendering pixels. So for the probably probably the majority of developers, you know, this is going to make their uh, Vulkan applications significantly uh, simpler to to write and and to debug. So again, it's um, it's been the the pretty much the top top number one request from developers to make that so widely available. And you guys have also done a lot in terms of the basic pipeline as well. Um, you can probably put this a lot better than I do, but I mean, my question was that you've done a lot of work with synchronization, reducing pipeline stalls. And obviously these are really big challenges because, well, everything obviously revolves around just milliseconds when we're talking about a frame. So even half a millisecond or two milliseconds could make a massive difference between like a 30 or a 60 FPS target. So yeah. could you perhaps explain some of the things you've done? Yeah, or well, rather introduced with the uh, mandatory update. Yeah, I can't get too deep. I'll get into trouble. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I, I can explain the concept. The, um, okay. <laughs> I mean, the, for, for, for for many of the developers, you know, there there are there are two places where you can get stalls, which is you know for for the end user, it's that annoying 
when when your frame rate drops and then you know, just instantaneously you kind of kind of a jarring um, judder. Uh, it's it's very distracting. Uh, it takes you out of your I'm suspension. Gonna of UE, I'm going to resist a UE4 joke there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's so yeah. You know, developers they they do uh, everything they can to avoid it. And there's a couple places where it can keep, uh, typically occur if, if folks aren't careful. Uh, one is when you're actually compiling uh, new sets of shaders, um, new, new pipelines. Um, you know, a lot of the uh, advanced games have you know, a, a lot of um, shaders to compile, and you know you, lo you load a new scene or you know, a, a new vehicle comes on you know, into the into the map or something. You suddenly need to compile a whole bunch of shaders, and that can cause um, uh, juddering. So something that we've done to um, uh, help with that is dynamic state. Um, very op very um, obscure names, <laughs> but anyway, the, what dynamic state is basically more parameters into your pipeline objects. So instead of having, um, I, I don't know, hypothetically, you know, ten different um, pipeline objects to compile, each with a slightly different set of parameters, you can actually feed um, a dynamic uh, dynamic state into um, a, a single pipeline, maybe. Uh, so you have, you know, significantly less um, shaders to compile. So less less shaders to compile means less time taken, less risk of um, juddering. And the, the other one is actually when the uh, everything is up and running, um, is you the, the developers do need to be careful to synchronize access to uh, resources, how they submit work into the queues uh, to feed work in, into the GPU. Uh, you need barriers to make sure that you know, one sh sh shader isn't writing all over the results of another, another shader, for example. And um, Vulkan has made good, good progress in significantly simplifying and uh, making more powerful the synchronization tools that developers can use. And in 1.3, we have uh, an upgrade, Synchronization 2, um, it, it's 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 more of an incremental upgrade to the good synchronization we already have, um, but no, it, there is there is some significant uh, again ease of use and good power and functionality to help that runtime uh, synchronization go smoothly. Um, I actually want to keep on the subject of Vulkan for one moment longer because you kind of went into device profiles earlier, but I did have a question on this, yeah. um, and I think you somewhat touched on it anyway. But I'll kind of parrot the question. Um, so you mentioned about the challenges associated with designing an API, because as you rightly pointed out, Vulkan can run on like an RTX 3090 Ti or whatever, all the way down to like a smartphone. Um, so what challenges have there been up until now in terms of designing an API? And has it, have you, have you ever like come across like a conundrum in terms of making a decision for the API in terms of performance and how does that kind of work in the back in the grant in the background for you guys when you're making these kind of considerations and how have performance profiles uh, assisted you with this so so yeah it, it is um it it is i think it's i think everyone agrees it's still a worthwhile goal to not have vulcan and vulcan es um you know because that that created a different set of um issues um Different APIs, you know, different specs, they diverge. Even if you try not to, um, they, they inevitably diverge. So the goal of having a single spec that you can you know, um, run everywhere in, in principle, it, I think is still the right thing to do. But because of this great range of hardware, therefore, that a single API has to cope with, there, there are some pretty tough design decisions. Um, and, you know, the dynamic rendering and the render passes was, was one, right? The um, it's resolved now, but you know, for, for a while there, the desktop guys were having to cope with stuff that was really mainly useful for mobile. Um, now, dynamic rendering has solved that problem, but that actually is a good example of being pulled in two different directions. The the profiles are a way to sanity. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like you you definitely have started to lose a bit of sanity at one point or another with that. <laughs> yes. yes. Yes, no, it's um, because it just lets you partition the, the problem space. Um, 
I mean, uh, over time, of course, you know, the even the lower send hardware will, will catch up, but by then, you know, the high end hardware would have um, done, put, done more. So it's not that we're headed in different directions. It's just that we're we're ready at different time scales. And actually, ray tracing is a good example, right? Another good example. Obviously, ray tracing came first in desktop. There are some mobile chips now that have ray tracing, but the you know, the vast majority of mobile chips don't yet have ray tracing, but they will. Um, so if we give ourselves the tool of profiles, we can be very clear saying this is the set of hardware right now that can support something like ray tracing. We give the clarity to uh, the developer community. It's not that random, you know, oh, you know, ray tracing will appear at some some point. It's up to you to figure it out. <laughs> um, the working group puts in a significant time and effort to, to give this high grade um, uh, G2, you know, this in intelligence information saying, this is when ray tracing is going to be available on this class of device. Uh, it just lets developers make you know, better informed uh, decisions. I think in some ways, though, it sounds a little bit like even what Microsoft have done, um, you know, in kind of layman speak with their own SDKs. For example, you have a lot of cross-gen games on the Xbox Series X or the Xbox One X or the Xbox One. And obviously, just for example, the original Xbox One doesn't support ray tracing or the Xbox One X and the Series X do, uh, does. And obviously their SDKs or whatever, they can choose profiles essentially. So yeah. in that respect, it's kind of, it's not like, um, you know, it's a radical idea. It's just, it's basically using smart engineering decisions because obviously the Microsoft guys, the ones that kind of choose the profiles for their console you yep. know, you can't you can't make a Jaguar processor behave like Zen two, basically. It's, you yeah. know. Right. So right. it's so it's, I, I think it's a very smart decision on your part. I think. I mean, I'm saying that as a non developer, but it does kind of seem like the as you said, the best way out of the out of the rabbit hole. Yeah, yeah. No, you're right. It's it, you know, it's the concept is not rocket science, right? We're going to agree on a set of functionality. The um, getting that agreement. Is is extremely <laughs> key, but you're right. Yeah. Microsoft have had shader shader levels for for a long time. It's it's, it's a similar idea. Um, so uh, this actually kind of brings me to the other question because we're talking about the future and targets. What about the roadmap? Because you guys have already pushed the 2022 roadmap. So could you explain more about that? Yeah. So um, we put out the first uh, roadmap profile, which is you know, 2022, which as the name implies, is fairly near term. Um, and there's some interesting uh, things in the in the roadmap. Again, that's what all the hardware vendors in kind of mid range mobile th up through desktop are saying is going to be pervasively uh, available. And you know, that will get some updated over time as we you know, proceed into the future. The, the, the other thing that the, uh, the working group is working on right now, we haven't released it yet. But we're, we're looking to release even longer term roadmap guidance you know, on a, like a five year uh, timeline. Mm -hmm. um, the idea is that we can um, get agreement amongst the IHVs in time for those roadmap decisions to actually affect silicon roadmaps. Because you know, that's that's kind of the, the timeline you need. Okay. To That's agree. also quite great for me as a leaker as well, because I can just look at you guys and be like, huh, OK, so this is coming on the future GPUs. Yeah, yeah <laughs> no, it, exactly. And it helps it helps um, it helps everyone because no, exactly the, the, the hardware vendors know what they need to ship in time that you know, it can actually affect their silicon designs. Uh, it helps the software community plan on what's coming in the pipeline. Um, so they can you know, plan their, their roadmaps for their titles and games uh, too. It obviously, as it gets further out, it gets less detailed. Um, you, know, you haven't done the design yet; you can't write you know, a, um, a detailed design spec. But I think it is a laudable uh, goal, and, and you know, we're working on the first ones. Can I ask? Um, I think it would be a really good for us to kind of uh, kind of sketch out this because I think there is a lot of confusion with people who perhaps are not in the industry or just getting into the industry. Um, what, say for the sake of discussion, we're talking about a feature that's say ray tracing, although you know all of the ma major players are supporting it, like even Intel with Arc when it finally launches. Um, how does a feature become 
agreed upon quote unquote on the industry in the industry so for example um you know gpu manufacturers for example uh you know um uh, apis and so on could you explain just briefly how that kind of how how basically something becomes ratified i mean one of the very simple examples that i can't, i always come back to is the fact that uh, nvidia with ray tracing kind of pushed the hardware outs first including uh, ver variable rate shading support there was mesh shaders but obviously the api at the time directx 12 uh, just didn't support it because obviously you know they were kind of working on stuff which makes sense and they had to go with basically their own kind of in-house uh, extensions right so how does that kind of work i guess is the question yeah that's a, that's a great question so the the first thing to you know, always remember is don't try and standardize stuff too soon um, I think we you know we've talked about that before. Now that way definitely lies madness. <laughs> if, you, if, you're, if you're still trying, you know, if any all the hardware guys are still guys and girls are still trying to figure out how a new piece of technology is going to work. No one really knows whether it's going to work or not. Uh, people are still experimenting, you know, in their in their secret labs. You know that it's too soon. It's too soon to standardize. Uh, the right time to standardize is when there's you know pretty good growing acceptance of okay you know this is good functionality it's going to get used and we we all know we all might go off and do it implemented in a different way in our silicon but this is the way this is an api that we could agree on you know to to drive that new generation of um of functionality in, in our gpus so so what normally happens and, and ray tracing is an is is an example is when a piece of technology like ray tracing gets to that stage where you know, it's no longer you know, um, freaky science fiction, it's like, oh, OK, you know, this is how we would do it. Then one of the IHVs typically would make a proposal. You know, someone makes the first move saying we would you know, we would propo propose this as an API. Um, they may have experimented with an, their own video um, uh, vendor extension which actually is what happened with ray tracing nvidia had a, a kind of like a prototype um yeah, wasn't it like chronos um it was like a sorry it was a vulcan api right yeah, BK, BK, yeah. yeah. bk um, underscore nv or something like that yeah yeah yes vendor extensions so they all always have the um the vendor prefix and nv is nvidia's yeah but mm -hmm. everyone has a prefix um so and that experimentation with the vendor pre the, with the vendor extension uh, gave us the confidence to go to Cross saying that we think this is a workable API. How about we make it a standard? Is everyone ready? Um, and then uh, if people are willing, then it goes into the working group. And you know, there is normally a pretty good polishing and you know, re-engineering exercise. Very rarely does the Vulcan working group you know, just rubber stamp something. Um, if you bring multiple perspectives to bear on you know, any uh, API design, it, it gets better uh, because people you know. Oh, I didn't think about that, you know, or oh, the mobile guys did this, or whatever. Uh, so it gets it gets better, and then um, that uh, consensus built uh, cross vendor uh, extension um, will be released. We need conformance tests, we need implementations because you can stare at a spec for months and it looks perfect and you try to implement it in the first 20 minutes you go wow what, what? <laughs> i missed this right <laughs> yeah well i think one of my favorite memes in tech is a guy like you know like a you know one of the one of the meme faces they're staring at a computer screen he's like it doesn't work why and then it says 20 minutes later it works why <laughs> yeah why did that ever work exactly yes yes it's, 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 same thing so you have multiple people implementing kicking the tires that and then that's ready then to release as a public uh, spec so that's the story okay. of story of an extension life cycle yeah okay um and this actually brings me i'm going to kind of go away from the graphic stuff just for a moment and we'll circle back uh, i just want because I, I just want to quickly touch on opencl uh, because you guys have released some uh, new sdk upgrades and also for those unfamiliar with uh, opencl that's pro I mean, I, we have talked about OpenCL previously, but for those who've missed that interview or not so familiar with OpenCL, could you perhaps just give a quick overview of what OpenCL is and then the SDK stuff? Yeah, so OpenCL is a, uh, well, CL stands for Compute Language. 
So it's not a graphics API. It's an API for getting compute acceleration uh, by offloading uh, compute onto multiple CPUs or GPUs or DSPs or even FPGAs. Um, the, the way that OpenCL works is that you take your application, um, like a C application, for example, C language uh, application, and it, it, like Vulkan, it's a pretty low level API, so you get to control everything. Uh, so you get to decide how you want to split your application code up into small uh, kernels that they're called in OpenCL. So you know, if you have a very um, compute intensive part of your application, you'll, you'd split that off into a kernel. You can compile it uh, using a, you know, a C-like compiler. It's called OpenCLC. It's very, it is very C-like. And you have an API then that takes those compiled kernels and you can interrogate what your system has. And you may have multiple GPUs, or if you're in like an embedded system, you may have multiple DSPs. Uh, you can figure out what's there in your system, and you can download the kernels for execution onto any of the available hardware, run them, and get the results back. So the, the whole OpenCL framework is you know, a couple of APIs to interrogate and use the hardware and a compiler or compilers uh, different languages to uh, to compile the kernels. Ah, uh, so what about the SDK upgrades? Yeah, so this actually goes back to the, the thing I was proud of at the beginning, and that is, you know, uh, and it's not just Vulcan. A lot of the working groups are beginning to uh, focus uh, not just on the API specification in in isolation, but looking at the larger lifestyle of developers and trying to make it easier for developers to you know, develop open, OpenCL apps. In it. Um, and the Kronos has put some funding into uh, upgrading uh, the SDK, um, and which has just been released um, a, a few weeks ago. And bef before, before this work, um, if you were a, a, a software engineer coming into OpenCL, you'd have to do some homework to find all the bits and pieces that you needed to start uh, writing OpenCL applications. Um, and you would maybe find some gaps is in bits and pieces that you need. And it would not be a very easy ramp up experience for people to write their first OpenCL, just from a logistics point of view, just, just getting everything configured on your Windows system or your Linux system so you could start writing that hello world in o OpenCL. So the SDK upgrade is basically making sure um, to you know, at least a step along the way to making it much easier for uh, an OpenCL developer just to simply download an SDK. Everything you need to start uh, writing OpenCL code is there, and you know, hopefully that'll really make things a lot easier um, for people developing OpenCL uh, out there in the real world. Can I? Um, I mean, one of the one of the really interesting things, of course, is you know, in tech at the moment, is just how much we're moving towards different accelerators. So, I mean, you know, but I'll quickly mention that obviously back in the day, we only had really CPUs. Then, you know, the world of GPU computing started. Then GPU computing became even kind of crazier with, you know, for example, tensor cores from NVIDIA and so on and so on. And now we're moving on to a lot of FPGA stuff coming on die, like, you know, the recent... Um, acquisition of the Linux by AMD. So you can imagine um, there's also been public patents as well. Um, FPGA is basically embedded on DAI. Um, and so I'm just, I guess what I'm trying to say is it's going to be, I think, you know, compute based ecosystems in the cloud, for example, are going to become a lot crazier, I suppose, or a lot more complicated with accelerators for very specific things, right? Especially when we're dealing with huge data sets like not gigabytes of data, but potentially terabytes of data. Yeah. So I think it's, uh, you know, I mean, you could probably explain this a lot better than I could, but I suppose OpenCL and all of these SDKs are kind of getting ready almost for the next level, if you excuse the pun, of compute. Yes, absolutely. The um, And you'll see um, both Falcon and OpenCL uh, um, being, being used to tap into offload uh, accelerators. Now, now Vulkan um, 
is specifically targeted at GPUs, but also GPUs are very common offload accelerators. So that's why Vulkan is widely adopted. But Vulkan you know, is um, um, continually upgrading its compute capability as well as its graphics rendering capability like ray tracing and, and stuff. And increasingly, you know, that compute is being used uh, even in games you know, uh, for you know, um, uh, inferencing you know, um, is just as important now in many cases as you know, rendering uh, the pixels. But, but the big difference between Vulkan and OpenCL is OpenCL uh, can use these different types of uh, offload accelerator, which can be you know, vital if, if, if they're there and you want to use them. Now, um, Vul Vulcan won't help you use a DSP, uh, for for example, and because OpenCL doesn't have graphics, um, uh, people actually find it is it's actually a slightly simpler programming model. It's more like programming a CPU. You know, you do have to carve it up into kernels, so it's not exactly uh, like a single-threaded you know, CPU application. But your kernels are much more you know, familiar in terms of you know, oh, this is like a little CPU program. I'm just running a lot of them in parallel. Um, and the runtime can be lighter weight. The you have all of the language capabilities like full fledged pointers. Um, so Vulkan and OpenCL, they actually are quite a good complementary pair. But you're right. You know, um, however, you get to your um, offload compute, it's a growing trend. The you know, the fabled end of Moore's law is somewhat true. You know, you the, running the CPUs faster and faster. You no, know, is um, not something we can keep going on forever. So parallel computation is the way forward for higher performance. I think, I mean, I don't, um, I think with the, I mean, even AMD in public mentioned that they're going to start throwing accelerators into their future APUs for, you know, um, I think it's DSPs they've mentioned and other bits. And obviously being able to, even smartphones, we've seen that, you know, just extensively for, for example, camera processing or what have you. Yep. So it's 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 a really interesting thing because, um, you know, the rumors, quote unquote, with the next generation AMD GPUs, we're obviously seeing chiplets, CPUs now chiplets, but it's it's quite interesting. Like the 5800X3D, of very it's not compute die, but you know we've seen the um, the uh, whole bunch of cash thrown on. So it's I think what I'm trying to say is socks. Let's say in five years time. And that's obviously why you're talking about roadmaps of five years in the future are going to look substantially different if you look at a block diagram in five years' time, I think, versus now. Yeah, and it's, it's very interesting. The um, you know, to, to a certain extent, you know, the mobile SOCs, the chips that are in, 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 in smartphones, have gone heterogeneous you know, much sooner, much faster than the desktop um, processors. You know, there, there are typically you know, a whole bunch of different you know, DSPs and other processors in, in your mobile phone. And OpenCL is commonly the API that's used, and even though it's not a, a platform API officially supported by Google, you know, all of the mobile SOC vendors ship OpenCL, and a lot of them do use it for inferencing and the camera apps and everything you know, that, that runs uh, accelerated on, on the mobile. And it's very interesting, even on the desktop, I, it's a public thing, I saw it and um, from Intel, very interesting article, that um, there's a lot of compute in building um, your ray tracing um, data structures. And uh, Intel put out an interesting little article that you know, they're using OpenCL to build their ray tracing data structures for feeding into Vulkan. <laughs> That's actually really cool. And, yeah. you know, it, it also, because obviously efficiency is a really big thing as well. Like, um, I don't want to say too much in a video, but I have a friend that works at Apple. He doesn't tell me like any, you know, naughty things, but. Um, he was really proud of that M1 silicon and, you know, the, the, the efficiency of M1. I'm not an Apple guy. I'm not going to lie to you. Um, I'm not in the ecosystem, although I do think their privacy is pretty cool, but that's beside the point. Um, but, you know, I think the efficiency we're starting to see in Apple silicon is something that's going to have to start trickling down like uh, uh, Intel and AMD are making a lot of strides on x86 to improve efficiency. You know, we've seen the heterogeneous architecture or big little or whatever you want to call it, for example, with uh, older lake and obviously that's coming into Zen 5 as well from AMD and all of these accelerators. So I think it's like you said, it's kind of interesting that we're almost coming full circle where the, 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 the performance of the mobiles are trying to catch up to the desktop, but the desktop is trying to catch up 
to the packaging tech in some ways anyway i'm obviously simplifying it of the mobiles it's kind of strange yeah no exactly and you know the one of the nice things about the m1 and the, you know one of the where a lot of their good performance comes from is just like a mobile soc you don't have different memories for gpu and, and cpu uh, everything is all packaged together and which is what mobile socs have been doing for a long well, time that's what so, amd are working towards I, I i you probably can't comment on this but i'm hearing that amd are trying to do the same with their uh, apus like i think it was I don't have no, notes up in front of me, so I could be wrong, but I think it was Phoenix. And they've also got a different caching structure as well, which is, I'm told, I, I think it's Phoenix. Again, I don't have my notes up, so I could be wrong on the on the, on the, on the APU. So uh, if I'm wrong on, that, on this and I contradict myself in a future video, I don't have my notes. It's on the difference. It's on my laptop. Uh, but I think it was Phoenix as well. It has like a, a different uh, cache structure. So I think it's like shared l3 cache last level cache and it doesn't have uh, infinity cache and basic uh, yeah, so it's not using infinity cache for the shared uh, data for the cpu and gpu i think it's l3 and then you have a shared um you know main memory system so it's a bit like console in that respect it's unified memory space basically yep luckily i know nothing so i can't get myself into trouble <laughs> okay um but that brings us to another question anyway before i get one of us in trouble um, <laughs> uh so I, before i move on to haptics and the you know the the dreaded metaverse um i did want to talk a little bit about some of the other big trends in the industry and how uh you know the chronos guys are kind of and girls are thinking of this stuff so for example we've seen temporal ml reconstruction with dlss and amd are now kind of doing that with fsr2 yep. um and we've seen obviously intel do the same thing if they ever release xcss um <laughs> but uh nvidia have already mentioned about the streamline technology which essentially acts as a framework for these different scalers and there's a you know even uh, in, uh unreal engine uh 5 has its own scaler as well you know it's getting kind of Curious, how does Intel? I'm sorry, how does Kronos feel about these competing standards? Like, do you think you're going to have some type of like way to kind of calm things down a little bit to offer your own solutions, or is not something you're too worried about yet? Or it's a very interesting question. Um, actually, you, you, you maybe given me an idea, but the um, so far this hasn't come up at Kronos yet because. Um, this is a, a layer above uh, the Vulkan API, uh, at least at least today uh, it is, and, and maybe it should be uh, for, forever. But but it, what, what NVIDIA have done with the Streamline uh, initiative is they've put a framework into open source, um, and it has a, uh, it does have a, like a, so uh, a common API you know, into that open source framework. Uh, so you can do all the things you need to do to get to you know that kind of the, the the upscaling, whatever the actual upscaling engine is that you're using, and it's easy for any of the hardware vendors to you know, integrate their particular uh, uh, scaling technology, you know, into that framework. So, um, so yes, it, it is it is actually defining an API, um, which is you know hadn't really struck me before. Like, hey, that's an API. So. It's kind of interesting because, like, to my to my very limited understanding of something like, uh, and again, you could probably I'll talk about DLSS because it's not, um, you know, it's 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 publicly available information. Mm -hmm. But for example, um, or uh, FSR one, like obviously very uh, FSR one to FSR two, obviously one spatial and one's temporal, and but to my understanding, you know, they basically operate quite pretty much as close to the end of the rendering pipeline. I think it's like a blur and a few other things um, are done after the scaling. And yes. then there's the UI, which is generally not scaled. I think AMD's implementation of uh, scaling in their drivers, it's done, I think, including the UI, but I think NVIDIA's NIS is not, if memory serves. I don't think it does include the the uh, UI. So basically, it's kind of an it's kind of an interesting one with how scalers work. I have no idea about no. Actually, XCSS works the same as well because I interviewed a couple of Intel guys on it. 
Right. So um, yeah, it's it's kind of it's kind of a weird it's kind of weird because you know we've got uh, I can't remember what um, Unreal Engine five is. is is it TSR I think it's TSR um, but yeah is it TSR for UE five My brain's gone blank. I think so. I haven't read that one for a while. But there's a bunch. Of, <laughs> yeah, like, it's a lot. Let's just say there's a lot. Th th there's a lot of them, and that's why you know this API again. It's separate. A Vulkan app doesn't know what's going to happen to it downstream. Um, so it is a separate API uh, to Vulkan. But um, but it is an API that gives you portability across all of these different scaling technologies. Now, this might be a case where open source is actually best uh, rather than an open standard because you know it's a piece of source that people would actually use to do the integration on, on, their, uh, on their system. Um, and I, it hasn't come up yet. And we haven't asked the question, but it may come up. You know, if if the API needs to be standardised at some point, TBD, then of course <laughs> Kronos would volunteer to host that. Um, but yeah, it hasn't come up. Yeah, the open source seems to be getting good reception uh, so far. So I think open source at times can just be the you know. I mean, it's not even slightly the same thing, but even open source emulators can make huge strides, right? You know, open source sometimes can. I mean, look at Linux. You know, uh, the open source repositories on Linux sometimes bugs are fixed before they're, you know, before they're even commonly known. Yeah. So it's it can be. I think. I think. I, yeah. I. It'll be very interesting. It, it it'll all come down to, can everyone use the same implementation, or does you know, will the industry go in the direction where people will benefit from having their own implementation of that that framework? As soon as you have multiple implementations, then you kind of need an API spec. Uh, mm -hmm. Else, the different implementations won't know, you know, they won't keep in sync, and the API will fragment, and you know, you're, you're back into a fragmentation problem. Um, so that, that that's the thing to watch. You know, if but if everyone, you know, if that piece of open source does it for everyone, and everyone can use it, that, and then that becomes the canonical definition of what the API is, and everyone's happy, and you don't need you don't need the extra um clarity of a separate you know, spec that uh, guides the open source implementations so yeah it, it, either way it's fine um but if a spec is needed it would be something that the kernels could help with maybe okay that kind of brings me to another question um it's slightly io related because obviously it doesn't matter how fast your gpu or cpu is if you don't have the bandwidth or you can't get the data it doesn't matter yeah. um and uh, this has definitely affected a lot of Windows things, you know, with the, um, let's say, not so much ideal uh, file system of Windows at times, particularly dealing with like large cluster, uh, sorry, larger uh, IO reads, you know, tons of small files in particular. It's really hurt games. Microsoft have done really good, though, with direct storage, um, which obviously uses, it's more efficient in batching IO requests and also going to be using the GPU to decompress. Uh, I think it basically decompresses data directly, which is heading into the GPU. So it doesn't touch uh, CPU bound data. I think it just, so for example, texture data will decompress on the GPU. Um, will you guys be doing something similar with one of your APIs, which kind of does like direct storage? I know it's, I know, it, I know that as we've discussed, you know, the Vulkan API can run as like a layer anyway on Windows. So you know, a direct storage could still work. So is it something you guys are kind of thinking of or not so much, or especially in the data center? Like, how are you guys kind of seeing that? Yeah, so um, I can, I, we don't have anything to announce, but there's definitely uh, a lot of thought going into this. Um, you know, the direct storage release from Microsoft, it actually doesn't have the GPU decompression yet. It's, yeah, it's future, it's, right? It's also, yeah. But, but it, it, it's obviously coming, um, and so uh, and it, this is a uh, feature that's been um, asked for by the software developer community. So um, without getting myself into trouble yet again, I, I think we you won't have to wait too long. Actually, it goes back to this um, goes back to this um, you know, the life cycle of an extension. I think this is becoming a, a pretty well solved problem. I wouldn't be surprised if we started seeing you know, some of the uh, hardware vendors beginning to make proposals into uh, into the Vulcan working group 
for suggestions on how we could do this with um, didn't G nvidia have one as well um i can't remember nvidia's uh uh yeah nvidia has g deflated that's the um the, the lossless decompression um and yeah but they but, have another one though with uh, introduced with was it with Turing or ampere i can't remember the name yeah rtx yeah, yeah. that's it RTX, rtx io rtx io that's right that that's a that's a library um yeah but yes absolutely you know, all these things are beginning to to gel in the industry so Yes, the time, I think the time is getting very close where it would be the right time to standardize this in the Vulkan API. And I know um, we've talked about mesh shaders before um, with Vulkan, uh, but there was one question I didn't actually ask in my last uh, interview, I don't believe. Uh, with uh, NVIDIA, they can do NAS or NVIDIA adaptive shading, which is kind of VRS essentially um, via um, uh vulcan extensions what about vrs is that something that's actually is kind of running in vulcan right now or yes no that that yes gosh i think that was in um gosh i, I, oh, I need to remember i think that was in 1.2 okay yeah, i thought it was i wasn't yeah. Yeah, yeah 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 okay. yeah yeah no you 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 yeah you you jinked from mesh shaders into vrs you caught me off guard <laughs> Sorry, that was my, my brain yes, is so very good. like it's kind of jumpy shape. sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes even I'm like, what the, wait, what? The, like, sometimes I swear in videos, I'm like, I have to re-record a section. So I'm like, wait, did I just say that, or did I think I said <laughs> that? I have no idea at this point. Shh, damn it! Yes, no. <laughs> yeah, but no. Variable rate shading is that definitely, and that's one of the key things for, uh, of course, the the uh, virtual and augmented reality folks. That's um, one of their favorite. And that kind of brings us to that, actually, um, because switching gears and I have to do the joke. I'm sorry. With haptics, you could even feel the gear shift. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. Te uh, technology starts <laughs> to move into VR, a metaverse haptics. You know, a lot of it is basically in its infancy at the po at this point. Like, as you rightly pointed out at the beginning, we're kind of like at the stage where no one really knows exactly where it's going. And it's a little bit like the old school, you know, graphics APIs when we had tons of APIs competing, uh, including proprietary ones like Glide. And, you know, it seemed like everyone had their own API and obviously some of them just didn't do well. Uh, you guys have just announced um, a partnership with HIF or Haptics Industry Forum. Yes. And this obviously is kind of working in collaboration with OpenXR. So I, I guess the first thing is, what is OpenXR? We've talked about it briefly. Uh, so we've talked about it extensively previously. So if you can just quickly mention it. And also the challenges that you're hoping to overcome with HIF. Yes. Now, OpenXR is um, really one of the most significant uh, standards that uh, Kronos is, is working on. So for those who don't know, um, OpenXR is a is an API for portable access to hardware, not the GPU this time, but everything else you need in a, an uh, augmented or virtual reality system other than the rendering. So it's kind of a match pair with Vulkan. You, know, you can use Vulkan or, or DirectX for, for rendering your, your pixels. Um, but for everything about the, um, like an HMD, for example, um, controlling you know, the inputs, uh, making sure that everything gets routed um, you know, with the input pose, you know, with the, the position of of um, the HMD, where is the person looking? You know, all of that needs to be processed and handled to to generate uh, the output uh, through your rend rendering API. So Vulkan does all of the rendering. OpenXR does everything else uh, to enable a developer to write portable XR um, applications. And the good news is no. It, it, uh, OpenXR is relatively new. We, we, no, 1.0 is still you know, the current version of, of the spec. But the good news, and you know, this is one of the things I, I am proud of that Kronos has achieved, the OpenXR working group has achieved, we've been getting pretty much universal uh, adoption across the industry um, for wearable uh, displays. So you know, Meta um, and HTC and Valve, and uh, Vario and you know, a bunch of the other HMD vendors, and there's more and more of them uh, every day. It would have been a classic fragmentation problem, but no, OpenXR, I think, was fortunate. It was the right, it was a good solution at the right time. And so we have um, you know, uh, 
managed to save the industry from a whole cycle of, um, of fragmentation. And you now we have all the key players like uh, um, Valve have announced that you know, they are deprecating Steam VR. Um, um, they're, they're, sorry, they're deprecating their o Open VR API, which was their uh, older proprietary API, you know, and they're going to all their four development is on OpenXR and Meta and HTC. You know, so we have good industry uh, momentum. So that's, that's great. So, but as you rightly say, then what's the next step for uh, OpenXR? And that is you know, to go beyond the 1.0. Um, it's increased sophistication of user interaction is I think the next uh, frontier. Now, OpenXR has a bunch of extensions that are already kind of slicing off the first part of that problem and it's hand and eye tracking. And there's been a number of working group members, including Microsoft with the HoloLens, um, have you know, um, really bought some awesome hand and eye tracking uh, into OpenXR as extensions. And, and more and more vendors are beginning to ship that. Um, so that's that's here and available today. Uh, the next stage is haptics, as you say, which is you know, the, the visceral uh, mechanical feed, feedback, touch feedback. Um, but also, um, how do you go beyond just tracking hands to tracking complete uh, bodies for you know, avatar locomotion? Um, and as we go even more deeply into augmented reality, in addition to virtual reality, then understanding the user's scene and environment becomes critical. You know, if you're going to put an augmented chair in your living room, you know, you need to analyze the living room to know where the floor is. Uh, and you know, the, the scale and the position. Um, so um, putting that kind of scene understanding uh, into uh, OpenXR is is going to be a very in interesting thing. So haptics, to come back to your, your specific question, haptics is a very specialized area. And if you talk to the, to the good folks at the haptics uh, um, um, forum, they have it's fascinating the, the amount of analysis that they've done. You know, the psychology and physiology of, of haptics is um, very deep. I, I had no idea that you know, that people had been doing this much research and had this much insight into what needs to be done in terms of the me mechanical uh, actuators. So we're thrilled to have this liaison between Kronos and HIF because the you know we don't need to become haptics experts we can rely on the expertise that they have uh, we just need to know what is the api that we need to design so you can actuate you know, all this haptics functionality uh, in a good scalable future proof way and you know that's um, so we're, we're fortunate to have the hif folks um, at openxr to help uh, help us design the api properly I think this kind of brings me to the wider question of like the metaverse. <clears throat> I mean, there's a lot of discussion at the moment about the metaverse. I suppose from your perspective, because obviously, you know, the metaverse is something different to everyone, right? Like um, Epic are kind of working on their own metaverse. Facebook are working on a metaverse. I'm pretty sure some dude down the road is going to, you know, open up a metaverse and, you know, probably have like a, you know, a restaurant metaverse or something like that. Um, to you, what do you, I mean, what from your perspective, and I suppose to a degree Vulcan as well, um, sorry, Kronos as well, what do you kind of see as like the the short to medium term future of the metaverse? The one thing I know about the metaverse is we don't know what the metaverse is going to be. And I think, but I think it's going to be something. Um, and I, I think a productive way to approach the metaverse is kind of a ground up. Uh, approach. So I think it's it's hard to predict what the metaverse is going to be like in 20 years time and you know, what shape will it be and who's going to be in control and all, all these kind of interesting um, Twitter debates. <laughs> <laughs> but what I know is the uh, kind of comes back to what we we're saying right at the beginning. You know, Kronos has been working on all these 3D and XR um, uh, standards for many years. It turns out that they're all relevant to the metaverse. The, whole, the, the concept of 
some kind of spatial, you know, persistent multi-user environments, um, you know, maybe a spatial successor to the web in, in some form. We, we, we just know it's going to need 3D rendering APIs. It's going to need um, you know, transportable asset formats like GLTF. We know it's going to need OpenXR to drive all the wide variety of um, the display you know, and interface hardware. Uh, the crap the, ton of compute. Yeah, yeah, exactly. For all the AI, the inferencing, <laughs> rendering. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. So what we're finding is the um, a lot of what we're doing is directly relevant. And the interest in the metaverse is just accelerating, in, in the end, just accelerating the interest in all that wavefront of stuff that we've been working on for a long time, which is something that we we welcome uh, very much. You know, it's it's kind of another use case, another layer of commercial urgency that is you know, increasing the interest and participation in, in the standards that we've been doing. Um, and I think our, the best thing that Kronos can do is to continue, you know, stick to our knitting, right? If we make these um, the APIs we're working on better, more aware of the different use cases that the metaverse is going to bring, now we can help build the bricks that the metaverse is going to need. We don't have to know the plan yet for the whole cathedral. And, and, and a good example is GLTF, right? Uh, GLTF is, you know, is a 3D asset format. And I can't, I, I'm saying we're upgrading from a 3D asset format right now to a metaverse asset format. And what, what does that mean? Well, no, a 3D asset format, GLTF in its current form, it lets you to describe the um, the appearance of an asset, you know, the geometry, the textures, the materials, the animations, but it doesn't say it doesn't say anything about the properties of that asset. How heavy is it? <laughs> Currently, you can, right. there's no field in GLTF to say you know it has this mass, it has this elasticity. If you poke it, what's going to happen? That's what we need in the metaverse because you're going to want to drop these assets into you know, a wide variety of different formats. But you know, is it going to if someone throws it into a swimming pool in a you know a particular metaverse world, is it going to float or sink? You need to know, right? So, uh, GLTF is busy you know, building out that uh, attributes and properties and behaviors uh, as an additional um, um, set of information you know, to complement the, the the visual appearance. And that's just one example where there's a lot of interest in GLTF because of the metaverse and it's not just idle interest you know, there's some very interesting new use cases that's um, helping us uh, decide what our roadmap priorities should be because also it's like with all of this it's not just for the sake of entertainment for example um, you know this could also be used for doctors for surgeries it could be used to train people it's like there's a lot of potential outside of entertainment right yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm hoping the metaverse doesn't end up like a Ready Player One dystopian nightmare. <laughs> and the uh, and I I don't think I don't think it will. Well, I hope I hope it won't. The um, but certainly augmented reality is you no, know, and it, as you say, an interesting companion to the virtual reality because it brings people into the world rather than isolating them from the world. And I think in the end. AR will be more useful more for more hours in the day for more, more people than than virtual reality because you know you, you're not isolating yourself from from the world. I mean, obviously there are ex training and games. There's all kinds of good stuff you can do with VR, but um, you know, hopefully we don't all just plug ourselves in and never see reality ever again. Mm, I mean, the Matrix does have you. <laughs> I suppose it brings I think it kind of brings the question of what pill would you take right <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's it's a very interesting um, you know kind of it, these are the kind of questions where I suspect that if we were to revisit you know the this this topic of like what the metaverse is in five years I have a feeling that we probably would still say that we don't know in its in its infancy because I have a feeling it's going to you know like society has shifted so much in let's say even two years let alone I you know like memes on the internet change so I imagine the metaverse will probably change constantly although I'm saying that with very with a lot of ignorance let's say that yeah and, and you know I, I think it's not going to happen like Ready Player One it's not going to be 
developed by one company, in fact, one person, right, in Ready Player One. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not going to suddenly appear. It's, it's, it's as, I think, it's as, as you're saying, it, it will, it, all kinds of little things are going to happen. You know, Ro Roblox will do some stuff and they can, you know, um, people can create new types of content and people will start being able to uh, import, export content between the different um, environments. And you know, it'll all happen gradually. And you know, eventually, as you say, in 10, 15 years, we're going, oh, oh, the metaverse is here. We didn't notice. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it kind of happened with smartphones and even like the internet. I don't know. And then, you know, now obviously we're on web 3.0 or whatever you want to call it. And, you know, you, you don't kind of realize that one's shifted to the other. Right, exactly. And it's it's going to take a big Darwinian soup. Now, there's going to be lots of businesses that succeed. There's going to be lots of businesses that fail. There's going to be technologies that succeed, um, and and some that don't. And well, one thing, you know, with my Kronos hat on, one thing I know is that it's going to take a lot of interoperability standards. We're trying, you know, the the whole concept of a spatial web where all, so many things are working together. Now it comes back to again what we were talking about at the beginning. We're going to need I know, a constellation of different interoperability standards for networking, for rendering, for assets. All these things are going to have to work together at a scale that we haven't attempted before. And um, you know, that's why I cancelled all my vacation. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. No, but that's why we have a lot of work ahead of us in in the standards domain. No, we Would have you? You really it, contribute the right standards at the right time for this to work. It's also interesting because now we're kind of moving towards um, hardware itself being powerful to do local compute for VR. And we're not quite there yet, you know, for most stuff, but we are getting closer. And obviously a lot of rendering too could be offloaded to the cloud potentially. Yep. Um, yep. That, that whole cloud XR thing is very interesting and actually OpenXR is already enabling that you can have a um, a split client server implementation of OpenXR and an OpenXR app will happily will happily run on a um, like a um, edge server for example um, without needing any changes so the you know, the API is not just giving the OpenXR API is not just giving you portability between different vendors, HMDs. It's giving you uh, portability across different uh, deployment architectures, like you know, all in one on your head or um, in in the cloud rendering. I mean, it's very interesting now as well. We're starting to see these, you know, uh, Valve devices. I suspect that Valve are probably going to be really doing a lot with the Steam, you know, Steam Deck. There's going to be some really interesting things. There's a lot of, I mean, I've personally been hearing rumors of like a new portable PlayStation as well, whether it actually comes out because obviously stuff is canceled all of the time. But allegedly, you know, the portable PlayStation can run PSVR, um, you know, and you can easily just do some, you know, very simple map napkin maps. And you can say, well, you know, if they did it on like, it's say the target of the console because the design started in, let's say, uh, I heard it was like very early 2021. So consoles take two years is not happening. Three years is possible. Four years is probably likely. So if we say that, say 2024 for the release date, 2025, they're going to be on a free and end process. And you could say, well, they're going to have at least, you know, three, four T flops of compute power in that thing, which should be more than enough to kind of do some local VR maybe not at the highest frame rate, but they're going to have upscaling technology. You can start to really see the Sony, Valve, all of these companies could have some really interesting tech, you yeah. know, just on VR alone. It's it's really cool stuff. Yeah, we're going to be living in the future. <laughs> I mean, I guess the one last question I've got for you before we uh, draw it to a close, what do you feel the state of um, the industry is in terms of like... Um, versus say two or three years ago what challenges do you think we've got other than the obvious one of like more performance what challenges do you think there are in terms of both hardware and software side great question i mean i, I think the 
the technology that has the potential to change all other technologies. So it's not necessarily um, a problem. Um, it's more of an opportunity. But you know, how we best deploy this opportunity, I guess you could you know, phrase as a problem. And, and that's uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence. Uh, m machine learning is has the potential to change so much of how we create technology, how we use uh, technology, and how we need to, you know, to develop platforms and systems to best deploy uh, machine learning and AI. The uh, and there's obviously has been so much progress um, already, but I think we're st still at the just the beginning uh, of the curve. Um, you know, and th th just to kind of bring it back down to earth, in in, in the Vulcan working group, you know, we have a subgroup in Vulcan called you know, Vulcan Machine Learning, which is what do we need to add to Vulcan so a game can use you know, inferencing and machine learning um accelerated you know in the com company confines of their vulcan api they don't have to go off into a different runtime which would add a lot of complexity you know um what does vulcan need to do to support that part of the uh, game engine needs you know it, it's going to be just as important as the as the rendering uh pipeline so i think you know that that's that is i think the thing to watch well i think um we've been talking for about an hour and a half and i know that for you it's quite early and you <laughs> probably have some actual work to do <laughs> oh we're a coffee about that it's too early for gin and tonic god damn it <laughs> <laughs> you'll probably need it after speaking to me <laughs> to be honest i'm like one of the only brits i know that doesn't actually drink on one of the the odd ones out <laughs> well, I, I just like, although it is pretty late right now, I'm just like, damn, it's like, on UK time, it's like half seven, and I'm thinking, man, you know what would be pretty sweet right now, like a coffee or four? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's cool. It's always it's always good to talk to you, Paul. It's, yeah, it's I, been a lot of fun. It gets more and more fun each time. So hope Yeah, we'll have to talk in like six months. I mean, I guess in like, given the, you know, release history of Vulcan, uh, you know, it seems every two years you're also releasing like the next iteration as well, which is kind of funny. Yeah, and you know, the we, we haven't set a date, but I I don't see any reason why we would move off that kind of um, that kind of broad broad schedule. So yeah, I I mean to be fair, that the technology is moving so down quickly as well as you said, and I I suspect you know if we if we were to do an interview in like four years time. You know the the devices we have in the palm of our hand are going to be so damn powerful anyway. Hopefully, it may be in some early form of the metaverse. Who knows? <laughs> that would be really interesting. Hey, maybe I could interview you in the metaverse. Now that, that would be something. That would be actually quite cool. I've actually done um I've actually done a um a, what would you call it um a meetup in um in the metaverse in mean, one of the um uh, VR environments. It was oh. actually. It was actually quite interesting. Harder logistically to get everything together than doing it in Zoom. Um, but although know, we didn't exactly have the easiest time, <laughs> <laughs> but you you do get a different kind of interaction. You know, you, people talking in small groups that you know, aren't so possible. The the, the the big thing that's really going to make that kind of thing take off, though, is you know the avatars are still currently just. Um, standing there, largely just staring blankly at each other. There's no facial expressions. You yeah, don't get Kenny Valley. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but the people that were I was using a quest to, and you know, at least you get hand expressions. So uh, actually, that was a that was a thing. You know, that's be better than it was a couple of so years. So if the person ago. annoys you, you can put your finger up at them. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but facial, facial tracking, and when you can tell if someone is smiling or frowning in some way, um, I think that is going to lift it up and make it actually more useful for kind of um, technical conferences and webinars. It really, the 3D avatar stuff doesn't really add a lot a lot of value to, to warrant the extra hassle, but, but I, soon. I think it would be really interesting actually to see um, with the new Unreal Engine uh, 5, obviously Sony and all of the other companies are putting so much money into Metaverse, but I mean, just for the sake of argument, I know I've used this, I'm pretty sure I've used this example before, but just for the sake of discussion, 
let's say you're watching a a race, you know, like a like a cars on a racetrack go around, and you can actually be quote unquote in the crowd, or perhaps you're watching, you know, the new Jurassic Park movie, and you could kind of almost feel yourself as like a side, you know, like a side character in there, like running from the dinosaurs or something like that, yeah. you know, or you could perhaps be like a passive observer. So you almost have like control of the camera in a 360 degree way. So you could see, you know, Alan Grant running from the Velociraptors from above or go to the left or whatever. Yeah. You, it, it really is interesting. I suppose a lot of this is really going to be like machine learning and, a lot of other cool stuff but again that's probably going to be like you know 20 years into the future maybe yeah we're going to need something like machine learning particularly if you have branching um content it becomes almost impossible to manually create a rich environment that we choose your own adventure yeah yeah <laughs> because it, it becomes like old style vision processing right you had to manually figure out how you wanted to analyze every pixel and it does you can particular things you can do, but you just just general purpose. Now drive this car, throw a scene at it. It's impossible to describe the processing. You just have to train it like a baby. Um, and the content engines are going to have to be. You can't possibly describe every outcome, right? If you throw you know, five team members into an open environment and they can do anything they want, and it, it affects the storyline, you're going to need to be um, having some machine learning thing that's you know, generating dynamically it's um very interesting problem you know that's that's quite a long way out it's pretty cool though it is cool yep okay yep. i i really am gonna let you go now because i feel really <laughs> guilty of keeping you for like 90 minutes no this is cool okay i'm gonna stop the recording uh, oh oh actually before i do did you want to kind of let people know to go anywhere check things out oh well yes obviously the place to go is um www chronos with a k and an H, chronos.org, not .com, .org, because we're a, a, a non-profit. Yeah, but all, of, all the information on all of the standards are there. I will also, of course, throw all of the relevant links in the video description as well. And uh, yeah, uh, thanks very much for the chat. It's been, it's been a cool one. Yeah, this has been awesome. Yeah, so, okay. thank you. Please invite me back. <laughs> <laughs> okay.